Hey there, I'm Chef Dennis, and today we're here with Good Day Google Plus. And it's always a great day on Google Plus, especially when I get to share this stage with some of my friends. And uh, today we're going to talk about food, so I'm excited, as any foodie should be. And we're going to talk about ethnic food because everybody really loves the foods that they come from, places they come from, and you know they want to share them with different people. And I, I guess there is some typical American fare, but we've drawn so many foods from so many different countries and so many different cuisines that you know they've kind of melded together. So today we're going to bring you a look for some people that cook, that have cooked and cook in strict cuisines, so they don't influence them as much, but you know they possibly may share some ideas on that as well. And as we talk about each cuisine, please ask questions. Okay, you can put them into the uh, the bar underneath the screen that you're seeing and direct them to any of our people that are on today, any of my guests, and we'll try and answer them. But we're going to talk about the different cuisines, and we're going to find the common elements, some of the things that are different about them, and some of the things they've used to adapt the cuisine to maybe modern times or not, however they want to choose. So let me run through our guest list real quick, and we will talk to everyone in a bit. Uh, but I just want to introduce everyone, starting on my far left, uh, I don't know if it's yours, but on mine, I have Betty Ann Cuerno, and she's going to talk today about Filipino and Asian foods, and I hear you have quite a guest list watching us today from your homeland, is that true? Yes, that's right, I have my entire um, province watching, my alumni network, my friends from the Filipino Women's Network, my uh, family and all my friends and uh, you know uh, the entire Filipino community so hello Mabuhay I'm very happy to be here good morning <laughs> thank you and I'm excited to have so many new watchers today too that's great for me and we have a friend of mine coming from the UK Dan Toombs and he's the curry guy so Dan's gonna be with us and we'll talk to him a little while later thanks for coming on Dan how you doing today good. great thanks Dennis uh, great, great to be here Oh, I'm glad to have you. And Domenica Marchetti, and she's going to talk to us today about Italian cuisine. So it's very nice to have you here today. Oh, it's great to be here. And it's it's Marchetti because Marchetti. the C-H in Italian is like a K. That's right. Just I, I've been I. in Florida too long, and they pronounce things differently. Too. Oh, I know. And it's, you know, Domenica Marchetti is not the easiest name in the world to pronounce. Um, but uh, Thank, And I should have known that, though, because I've been You have to say Domenica before. Marchetti. That's how you have to say it. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so used to Ecco Rico TV with my friend Giselle. Oh, that's just, the, you know, same sort of accent. There you go. All right, and we have Maggie and Maggie, your last name. <laughs> Unzueta. 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 Yeah, I, I have a, I have a mouthful. Of course, Maggie's my short name, but it's actually Maria Magdalena Unzueta Venegas. Try that five times. <laughs> you know, I, I am half Mexican, and oh, that's right, I forgot about that. And my, but my mother's name was Eunice, and she didn't have a middle name. But my wife has always teased me because I'm the only one in my family that had a middle name. She goes, why Why doesn't she have one? She says she does. It's uh, Eunice, Manuela, Magueto, Margarita. <laughs> no, I just go through as many names as I can think of. Yeah, yeah. Ma so, Maggie. Maggie Yu is usually what I hear a lot. So I've gotten used to it, I think. I think everyone around here probably can get used to that. Absolutely. Well, we're going to talk about food, and uh, like I said, if you guys have any questions about the different cuisines, and you know, and not everybody cooks in the cuisine all the time. Uh, we cook in what we like and what we enjoy and what our families enjoy, and there's you know, there's nothing etched in stone anymore. It's about what you like, but we're going to talk about each cuisine and, and what the differences and the similarities are, and if you guys have any questions for each other, please engage with each other, ask each other questions right. on the panel. That's what we're here today. We're here to have a good time. It's friends. If you haven't met each other before, this is my favorite part of the show when I get to introduce my friends to each other. And so let's just have a good time and see where it takes us. So let's start. Um, I'm going to start with Domenica today because ah. she's, a, she's an old hand at this and she's done these <laughs> and I'm going to let everybody else kind of warm up a little bit. Yes, so this is my about. second time. So... <laughs> Let's talk about Italian cuisine and, and where you see and what you see and how you've adapted or things you've done with it. 
Well, um, I, I will say that I've noticed uh, that over the decades, since the time I was a little girl, our understanding in this country of Italian cuisine has really come a long way. You know, when I was a little girl, it was... Um, I think uh, what Americans thought of as Italian cuisine was really Italian-American cuisine, and it was very heavily influenced by the immigrants uh, to the U.S. from southern Italy, from Naples, from Sicily, Calabria, um, those regions which all have wonderful food traditions. Um, but, you know, from the 1800s through the 1900s, we had kind of... Um, a, a cuisine of its own developed, which was Italian American cuisine. So, you know, the big meatballs, lots of tomato sauce, the New York style pizza, the Chicago style pizza. Um, and these things, you know, cannot be found in Italy, but they are what many Americans, uh, until I guess fairly recently, really thought of as Italian food. Um, and of course, in the 80s, we kind of discovered northern cuisine, and that was polenta, risotto, um, things made with butter, not necessarily olive oil. And from there, we've kind of evolved even further. So now we have a much better understanding, I think, of what regional Italian cuisine is. And even though Calabria and Sicily are both southern regions, the food in each of those regions is different and unique. Um, and even within the regions themselves, there are differences in Italian cooking. And when you go to restaurants now, um, there's a restaurant in Philadelphia, for example, called Le Virtu, and they focus on the cuisine of Abruzzo, which is um, the region that my family is from. And it, it um, it's kind of considered central south Italy. It extends east from Rome from about mid-calf out to the Adriatic coast and it's got a wonderful uh, diverse cuisine that um, incorporates the mountain cuisine of mountain foods and um, from the Apennine Mountains and also the wonderful fresh seafood from the Adriatic coast. So now we're seeing people really digging, deep, digging down and uh, looking at Italian cuisine and wanting to explore the individual regions. And I love that. Um, you know, it, it, the thing about Italy is it's such a small country, but in terms of food and cuisine and culture, it's absolutely vast. There's just so much there still to explore. Absolutely. And I think just going from region to region, we see so many differences. There are similarities, of course, just like yes. any food. But yes. the, the differences really, and in, like you said, even within a region, uh, one recipe can be made so many different ways. Yeah, that's the beauty and the, you know, that's sort of like, because uh, yeah, I might put a, a recipe up for pizza rustica, which is something that Italians eat to break the Lenten fast at Easter. And it's like, if you're going to break the Lenten fast, this is the way to do it. It's like this savory, heavy, tall tort stuffed with all, you know, meats, uh, you know, salumi, salami, prosciutto, soppressata, all diced up, lots of different cheeses. It's very rich. And, um, you know, I make Yum. it one way, but somebody... In Naples makes it a different way. They use different cured meats and um, their dough might be different. And so, you know, they might say, no, that's not how you make pizza rustica. You make it this way. And, uh, you know, so there's there's all these little, um, you know, Italians are very, we're very opinionated about our food. And <laughs> the way we do it is always the right way. So that's, that's one of the beauties is getting into these discussions about what, you know, which way is the right way when, you know, they're probably all the right way. Yeah. I think talking to any Italian grandmother or any ethnic grandmother, their way was the right way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, well, thank you. That was that was a good overview of it. And I know what you're talking about with the northern Italian in the 80s because that was about the time yeah. I really got involved in restaurant cooking. And uh, that was the big rage, and it was yes. all northern versus southern sauces. You know, right. we started introducing the cream and the cheese and the different things, as opposed to the southern that was always olive oil based. And uh, yeah, yes. it, was, it was a big thing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I know. I went into some real authentic regional cooking for a restaurant I opened, and it was more than the clientele could bear because it was a little too authentic. So that's really interesting. I, I yeah. hear about this a lot from restaurateurs and chefs who really want to bring authentic Italian cooking, um, you know, 
to Americans, and these are Americans who are educated about food, people who, you know, have traveled, but still they have, you know, their, their I don't want to say stereotypical, but, but the things that, that they like, and if you try to take it away from them, they, they kind of get upset. Like, I know that some chefs and restaurants struggle with people who order spaghetti or pasta as a side dish. No, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, you can do it, but... That's not how no. the food is meant to be savored. And I think as a chef, you know, you always want to educate um, your customers. At the same time, you also want to make them happy. So you've got yeah. these dilemmas that come up. Yeah, that's. I, I think that goes a long way with how we eat as Americans and how we're viewed as mm -hmm. ignorant is because we don't really know European cuisine and, yeah. and the different courses. And the spaghetti or the risotto would be your prima piatta. Right, so, exactly. And you would have a small judicious amount and it would be sauced judiciously. The pasta would be tossed with the sauce. You don't, you know, you don't pour the sauce on top of the naked noodles. Um, you, there's a, there are a couple of rare instances in which you do this, but, but uh, normally you toss the pasta with the sauce. You add just a little bit more sauce and maybe a sprinkle of Parmigiano, but you, you don't get these laden plates of pasta. Um, so it is a primo piatto because uh, there's not that much of it. It's a taste, uh, you know, of, of your um, of your pasta. And it, you know, Italians do love pasta, and many, many of them still eat it every day. I would. I, I pretty much can have it just about. Yeah. I'm not Italian, but I can have it every day. Yeah, yeah. You know, my wife gets tired of it, but we do have a bunch of different shapes, so that breaks the monotony for Shapes and sauces, yep. Oh, absolutely. Gotta <laughs> love it. All right, I'm getting too excited about food. I'm going to move on now <laughs> to Maggie, and let's talk about my ethnic cuisine, which i am I'm been happy to find more of it down here in Florida. Much. My right. wife does not like Mexican food, I hate to say. You mentioned that. I, yeah. I can't. I can't believe that, knowing you, but, you know, just listening to what uh, Domenico was talking about, yeah, it's the same, I feel the exact same way. The Mexican cuisine is so different um, from region to region, and what we get here in the U.S. is uh, mainly northern northern food, uh, the enchiladas and the, um, the tacos and things like that, but you go to southern Mexico, and I lived there for a very, very short time, but... Uh, their food is completely different. It's probably a little closer to what Caribbean cooking is like because you have the uh, pineapples and mangoes and salsas with mangoes and pineapples, and it's delish. I mean, it really is delish, but um, it's so different. It's different from what people have uh, perceived Mexican food to be. Um, and it, Oh, so I was going to tell you, because Dominic, I wanted to mention, when, uh, when uh, with Lent, we have a dish called capirotada, um, have you had that, Chef? Have you ever had capirotada? No, I don't think so. What does that mean? Can you translate? It's a bread pudding. It, oh. well, it's a bread pudding, but it's a Mexican bread pudding. It's Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I love this dish. Well, let's talk it's, about it. Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have to know. about this. Spill right the refried beans. Come on. Because <laughs> it only happens now. It only happens on Fridays, usually. And, of course, my mother's is the best. <laughs> but it's, uh, everybody has a different way of cooking it. Even uh, in my family's little town, like everybody cooks it differently. Some people will make it on the stovetop, a bread pudding on the stovetop. And we have a, a bread, it's a, it's a roll, but it's a long roll, it's called bolillo. And you cut it, you slice it into really, really small slices. And um, the way that we make it, I should just post this recipe because it's so yes, good. Yes, you should. I, 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 I mean, it's just it won't last long in my household. <laughs> oh, I would, I would love to give it a try because I love bread pudding too. So let's. But, but if you put it inside. Uh, well, we put it in the stock pot, a large stock pot, and we just layer it with bananas and peanuts and coconuts mm -hmm. and uh, and you have a, a liquid. We usually put it with uh, or make it with uh, piloncillo, which is a. Uh, uh, brown sugar, and uh, it's a reduction sauce, kind of, sort of, and you just let it kind of simmer. Oh, I forgot the cheese. The cheese is the best part. Of course, knowing me and my bacon popcorn, I don't know if you guys saw my, my show uh, with Larry for you, but I'd probably put the bacon in it. That doesn't, oh my gosh, it's just bacon. brilliant, like, aha, like, light bulb. So just is it hot. savory? Is it a savory no, bread? it's oh, sweet. It's, it's really sweet and delish, and it's filling, um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's good. <laughs> it sounds so. But, yeah, but one of the things I did want to mention about Latin or uh, the the Mexican food that I'm seeing here in the U.S. It's just so different from what is happening in Mexico. 
I live in San Diego. For those of you who don't know me, I live in San Diego, Coronado to be exact. But you know, we have a very, very big influence uh, with Mexico. I mean, I could practically throw a stone and hit Tijuana. But it, um, we have such a strong Mexican influence here. But I'm starting to see on both sides. I'll tell you about here first the fusions. Um, so again, going back to Larry Funier, I'm going to be on his show on the sixth. And we're doing our very first uh, bilingual show. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, Spanish being, you know, my native tongue. So I'm going to be speaking some Espanol. And uh, yeah, so we're going to be doing a little bit of both. It's, it's fun. And talking about fusions, this is a steak chimichurri quesadilla. Um, and you can see what it looks like. And it's just unbelievable. And I'm fusing kind of what I've... I have here with people just loving quesadillas and stuffing them with different things and chimichurri down in South America and you know Mexico quesadillas kind of thing. So, and yeah, where I came up with it was seeing all these different fusions going on in the uh, Americans trying to take stuff from different people. And similarly across the border, sorry, I'm talking too much. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so similarly down, the, uh, you know. Uh, south of the border, they, um, I'm seeing more fusions happen. Um, more fusions. Oh, yeah, I was at a Mexican restaurant over there and they served uh, sushi. Wow. <laughs> and this is That's a Mexican chef. This is a Mexican chef who, a uh, high end restaurant, and he, it was brilliant. Oh, it was such, I mean, he it probably doesn't was it true never sushi? been. What's that? Was it true sushi or was it his ad, uh, his interpretation? It, no, it was true sushi, but here's here's the take to it. He uh, he served it with jalapenos on the side, of course, and uh, some salsa, you know, just in case it was fiery enough or whatever. Sorry, UPS just wrecked. Um, but <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there's that. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I know growing up uh, in Texas, I got used to Tex-Mex, and that's what my grandmother made. You know, we, she was from Mexico, but we lived in Texas, and I guess they were close enough to the border. My grandfather was from a little town called Agua Calientes. And, uh, oh, yeah, I've been there. Okay, that's where he was from. And then we actually have a, a town in Spain for our surname because his relatives came from Spain originally. My grandmother was a squat little Mexican woman, and my grandfather with his blonde, blue-eyed, six-foot-two tall you know, Spaniard. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was wow. a big difference. But uh, you said you, you don't make a lot of Mexican food yourself, right, Chef? No, because you know I never learned. My mother could not cook to save her life. Uh, you know, God bless her. She she okay. was a nurse. No, she, when she was one of the older, and when she uh, was old enough, they sent her along with her older sister right to nurses' school, and they became professionals and nurses. And the younger ones, she was one of ten, were the ones that learned to cook. Uh, in the household with my grandmother, and so she never had that passion for it, which is probably why I did, because I loved it. and uh, with her working all the time, you know, it was my job <laughs> to feed us sometimes, you know, when I was hungry. So, um, uh, well, it served you well. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, my first memory of food was putting waffles in a um, toaster when I think I was old, I wasn't old enough to even know to plug it in. <laughs> not understanding why they didn't get hot, but eating them anyway. So, and that's the thing that's so important for me with my son. It's like, so this is my kitchen. <laughs> da, da, da. But anyway, so he uh, he helps me in the kitchen, and he has his own little apron, and it's cute. I love it. It's so important for me to have him in my kitchen cooking with me next to me. Even Absolutely. when he doesn't want to, he's kind of getting to that stage where he's too cool to uh, to cook in the kitchen with me. Uh, he, I'll, I'll put on music. I'll bring in his toys. I have his toys in here. It's like you come into this kitchen, <laughs> chop, <laughs> cook, uh, stir, taste. Yeah. As just as he gets older, he'll understand that uh, that's a good way to impress ladies too. Absolutely. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Are you kidding me? It's hot. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, well, let's move on now, and we're gonna we'll come back though, and let's talk to Betty Ann. And Betty Ann, let's talk about Filipino and what you cook and how you learn to cook and what your influences are. Thank you. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I just want to say um, there's a lot of talk about Filipino food these days, and uh, a lot of people have been saying to me, hey, 
Filipino food is trending now, so you're in the right place at the right time. I beg to disagree. Filipino food is not a trend. It's been a tradition for generations before me, the present, and it will be for generations to come. Filipino food is not a trend. It's a tradition to savor. Um, geography and history have played a large part with the formation of uh, the Filipino cuisine. Um, for nearly 500 years, the Philippines, which is a tropical country in Southeast Asia, was colonized by Spain. So uh, Spain's influence left a deep imprint in our cuisine, our culture, uh, our uh, va family values, our religion. Um, after that, for nearly half a century, the United States colonized us. Um, and then after that, we took what uh, influences we had from our neighboring Asian countries, China, Japan, Vietnam, Cambodia, India. We took all of that and made it our own. So our cuisine, Filipino food, has a little of everything. In fact, when Maggie was speaking and was telling us about all these delicious flavors, you know, it sounded all very familiar. Did you know that the galleon trades uh, um, uh, brought the tamales to our country? And uh, yeah. Yes, yes. So really? there's a, yes, so there's a lot of Filipino foods that are um, influenced by these. The, uh, oh, I'm sorry. My, okay. uh, my uh, family network is texting me and wishing me good luck right now. <laughs> We're good. You're doing fine. Well, thank you. Um, I was about to say, uh, if you like Chinese and Japanese food, then you will find something to like in Filipino food. If you like Spanish, Italian, Mexican, uh, French food, then you will find something in Filipino food that you like. Uh, that is what Filipino food is like. It's a layer of many different flavors. Uh, they're salty, savory, spicy, um, Predominant in, in in every dish I cook are the um, are what I call the blessed trinity. There's uh, garlic, onions, ginger, mm. peppercorns, bay yeah. leaves. Okay, and then often we have vinegar, soy sauce, and uh, on another note, we also add uh, fish sauce and shrimp paste. Now, the reason for this is uh, I go back to the geographical location. The Philippines consists of 7,100 islands, and a lot of the towns and provinces are located um, coastal, by the coast. So you see a lot of seafood uh, dishes. You see a lot of influences. Um, dishes that have shrimp paste and fish sauce, and this is because of the geographical location. Um, Filipino food also predominantly has uh, ingredients from major crops. Uh, major agricultural crops in the Philippines are rice, sugar, coconut, and bananas, and pineapples. So you're going to see a lot of these uh, ingredients in our food and it, it, it's a very interesting mix. Now when I came to America over 25 years ago, uh, I, I packed with me in my suitcase my mom's old cookbooks, her recipes, um, cooking gadgets, uh, the mortar and pestle which I call in the, which we call in the Philippines the almeres, uh, lecher flan pans, you know uh, even even cooking spoons and flatware, in fact, when I arrive in the United States, um, uh, people at the uh, airport, when you know, in customs, when they were checking my bags, saw all these things through the X-ray, and they said to me, "Ma'am, we have spoons here." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "I know, but those are my wedding gifts, and some of those belong to my mother, so there." Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we have spoons here. I love and, it. And, and I still do that uh, every year. I go back to the Philippines sometimes twice a year. Um, I try to avoid the tourist traps. I go back to my home province. I connect with family and friends. And every conversation begins and ends with the discussion about food. I try to bring back recipes from my hometown. I try to bring back cooking gadgets that you can't find here in the States. And uh, 
uh, I think uh, Dominica has seen that they, they featured on American Food Roots a um, cook an heirloom cookie mold, and I bake uh, Panda San Nicolas, which is a heirloom heritage cookie recipe. Yeah. So what yeah. Betty's I want to uh, tell people what American Food Roots is. What Betty's referring to is. Um, a website that I'm co-founder of called American Food Roots in which we explore why we eat what we eat and we tell America's food stories so this is you know this discussion is very much um, what American Food Roots is all about and so I, I would encourage people to go um, check out the, the website it's um, you know we all come from somewhere and food is what we bring with us when when we you know leave our homes I mean and, and it's what we when we want to connect with where we're from we cook right it's the it's yeah. the best way to connect yeah. and um, and so um, Betty was kind enough to share her wonderful recipe this lovely cookie um, I, I have yet to make it I'm dying to make it Betty and I will do it one day oh, thank but you. I don't have that cookie mold but anyway um, so uh, if you search the site you'll you'll find that recipe and many others as well and what you said about um, bringing stuff back in the suitcase just makes me think so much of uh, my family because when I was growing up we spent our summers in Italy mm -hmm. and um, you know in those days you couldn't really get good Parmigiano Reggiano it was hard to find um, there's still a brand of anchovies that are very hard to find here and so whenever I go to Italy you know to research for my cookbooks I mean I come back just I have tins of anchovies just stuffed into my suitcase and mm -hmm. um, you know other things that you just can't find um, we want those flavors and although it's I don't know about Filipino um, ingredients Betty Ann but I know that it's so much easier now to get uh, you know some of the best ingredients from Italy uh, things that we couldn't get 25 30 you know 40 years ago well you know that's true Domenica um, and I've been able to recreate uh, Filipino dishes from back home here in America by finding by by substituting with yes. the local ingredients that I find in the neighborhood grocery uh, but to go back to your um, topic about putting things in a suitcase uh, do you know that I don't know for some reason at the airport they already have bookmark and earmark and highlighted any Filipino that comes through customs oh god <laughs> uh, I think the dogs are trained to sniff shrimp paste, soy sauce, <laughs> and whatever Filipino ingredients we bring back with us. Uh, they don't even need to look at my passport, though I have an American passport. But, you know, when customs people see me, they immediately ask me, did you bring Tocino Longanisa? Oh, is that uh, right? Yeah, they <laughs> rattle yeah. off the entire list. And I look at them and I just... You know, I pretend I don't know what they're talking about, but sometimes, oh, I hope nobody's listening to this Google Hangout. <laughs> no, nobody is. Go on, go on. It's, it's just us. It's just us. You can tell us. <laughs> sometimes I do, you know. Uh, well, within reason, and I know what's allowed, and I know what's not allowed. You know, you're not allowed to bring fresh agriculture or produce. But right. I try to bring whatever I can. And the reason is, when I come back, I try to recreate the recipes that I grew up with and I've raised my two sons on it so I don't want them to forget this is why I keep doing what I do I don't want my sons to forget where they came from I want them to keep cooking uh, Filipino food and they do my sons are all grown now they're watching and they're cringing that I'm mentioning them but <laughs> they I'm very proud that now that they're all grown they they go look for a Filipino grocery near them and they cook in America. They're cooking in their apartments, Filipino awesome. food and sharing it with their friends. So That's yeah, awesome. they're proud. You've done and your job then. Thank you. Tim, Toby, I know you're dying of embarrassment, but I'm very proud of you guys. Well, not not to be left out of talking about suitcases. I know when I came back from Italy and France the first few times, my suitcases were packed with yellow label tea because we couldn't find it over here from Lipton, which is completely different, and coffee. Ooh. I was always packing with espresso, and then I found, like you said, I then I found mail order places to get it, so I didn't have to. But coming back from Sorrento one time, 
that when they were checking my luggage, the uh, the customs guy from Italy was so disappointed that I hadn't brought back any limoncello. Limoncello. Yeah. Going, no limoncello? You didn't bring back? I'm like, ah, uh, no. And now there's recipes all over the web yeah. for limoncello. Yeah. You know, it's actually yeah. quite easy to make. Yeah, and I have. I have made it. But, yeah. Uh, that was it's just funny when people yeah. think. And then bringing home, growing up in Texas and moving to New Jersey, well, try and find a tortilla. It ain't going to happen. And whenever we would go to Texas, <laughs> we would come back with a suitcase full of tortillas. You know? And so that was our, our, yeah. our main concern coming back. That and Dr. Pepper, we couldn't get that at first either. Then yeah. finally, Dr. Pepper. That's why. Yeah, make its way north. Well, we got one more cuisine to talk to, and he's sitting there so patient. I went through all the ladies first. Now, Dan, you're joining us today, and this is really interesting for me. You are an American living in the UK, yes. and you cook Indian food. Yes, I do. Yes, I, I moved here about 20 years ago, fell in love with Indian food, and uh, started buying all the cookbooks and all, and um, making Indian food as often as I could. And then about three years ago, when I started the Curry Guy blog, uh, I went to my family and said, listen, I'd like to cook I think we lost you there, Dan. Oh, yeah. bummer. And now finally we get to him and we lose him. Yeah. A little bit. Hopefully he can make his way back, because I'd, I'd love to hear... Um, his take. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I thought was so interesting is how he uh, created Indian food and learned to make it and his adaptation of it. Mm-hmm. And Dan is... And it's probably a riff off the British adaptation of Indian food and anyway, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's fascinating. And that's what's, you know, that's, that, what's, that is what makes America so interesting is... Mm-hmm. You know, we, we like mm-hmm. Betty Ann said, she has to adapt by using local ingredients... Um, when she makes her Filipino dishes over here, and um, I adapt as well. I mean, I, I travel back to Italy every year or as often as I can, um, but I live outside of Washington, D.C. in Virginia, and so, you know, I like to incorporate local ingredients, and so some, and I also feel there's an affinity between Italian cuisine and Southern cuisine, you know, like, um, uh, grits and polenta and, um, you know, oh, yeah. Prosciutto and and uh, you know Virginia ham and and so it's kind of fun to play around with um, these ingredients uh, you know and in, in these two very different cultures. Oh, we lost him. Oh, well, he may be coming back on yeah. us. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about your website too. If you could later on, if you could put those uh, the link to that. Yes, American food. I have my DomenicaCooks.com website, which is devoted to Italian home cooking, and then um, American Food Roots, which is uh, uh, you know where we explore. Um, we talk about uh, what re- American food right. really is and all of the different influences and fa- you know how our families influence what we eat and how our regions influence what we eat um, you know the, there is regional American cooking oh absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. so if you can put that American food roots on absolutely sure yes, I, 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 Dan you are muted so if you can unmute yourself well let's get back to you okay I think I'm back now there you go <laughs> okay let's talk about your Indian roots now we, 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 we live way out in the we live way out in the country, and I think that's probably part of the problem. <laughs> All right, so how did you get started with Indian food, and what really got you uh, got you motivated to cook Indian food? Well, I, I moved to the UK about 20 years ago, and Indian food is very big in the UK. So uh, when, I, when I moved over, I started buying all the cookbooks, trying to recreate what I had in the restaurants and all, and uh, really enjoyed it. But the, the books were all different to what you get in the curry houses around the, the UK. So I started trying to talk to people out of uh, their recipes and learning to do stuff at home. And about three years ago, I talked to my family and said, listen, I'd like to do nothing but cook Indian food for the, for the, for the next year, which is when I started my uh, Curry Guy blog. And the whole idea was to get the, the family into the kitchen, cooking together, and learning a different cuisine, and uh, just really hands-on, taking everything, taking the cooking to a different level. So that's where we're at now. Is we've been doing it for we're well into our third year now, and uh, we cook pretty much every day, and it's all Indian food. <laughs> what were your your really greatest influences, though? Where did you draw your your recipes from, and and adapt adapt them? Well, 
I, I learned a lot from the cookbooks I purchased. So I, I went and I, for like 20 years. I, I cooked. Uh, I cooked from the books, and I learned a lot of the techniques and uh, made a lot of food anyway. A lot of Indian food anyway. But um, the the main influence that I've had, especially since social media, especially since Twitter started and all, is I've been able to talk a lot of chefs out of their recipes because it wasn't too long ago, maybe five, six years ago. Indian chefs were not giving away their recipes. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's even a book called The, the Curry Secret. So you, you, mm. you try, people try to figure out how to recreate that Indian food. So you were so, learning it from Indian chefs, from authentic I, at the, at the, I have, especially more recently, now that with the, uh, with the Twitter thing going and uh, with the blog going, uh, I'm able to get a lot more chefs to share their recipes with me so that I can make them at home. And uh, so that's, the, the, yeah, all, all along the way I've been trying to talk to people about the recipes, which is what I've done my whole life, really. So I'm curious, Dan, have you traveled to India? I've never been. So that's, <laughs> see, that's so wow. interesting to me. Yeah. And I think, I, you know, it, it, it's possible to, uh, especially with social media and, um, and the Internet, it, it is possible mm -hmm. to learn a cuisine, but I'm wondering if you ever um, feel like you'd want to go there. Oh, I'd love to go there someday. Yeah, Remember, yeah. We're thinking about we're thinking about doing it over Christmas this year. It's a oh, yeah. Possibility. Yes. But, uh, Indian Indian food has a a, a very it's, it's very big here in the UK. It's kind of like Mexican food over in the states. Right. Yeah. You, know, you drive around the states and see a Mexican restaurant every corner, and that's what it's like over here in the UK. Right. With, with the curry and houses. it's very it's good Indian food too. I I went to, uh, I did my junior year abroad in London, and you know the only food that was good was almost the only food that was good at that time, that was back in the 80s, was uh, Indian. Um, you know, so when we wanted to go out for t food that actually tasted good, we would go mm -hmm. um, have Indian food. Now, I know that's changed since the years I spent in, yeah. in mm. England, but, um, but yeah, that, I do remember it was very good. Oh, there are, there are some brilliant restaurants over here now, but the, and the curry houses are all still very good. Uh -huh. um, uh, it's 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 a nice cuisine. It's 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 nice to go out for for a curry every now and then. And it is very big over here. Hey, John, I have a question for you. Are yeah. you? Because uh, uh, I was recently on a hangout with um, Richard Wooding, who's down in um, South Africa, and he showed me a menu uh, of a Mexican restaurant that he goes to, and I was just blown away. Uh, so tell me about the Mexican food in in uh, in the UK. What do you think? Especially coming from uh, America and knowing what Mexican food actually tastes like. I mean, what's your take on UK Mexican food? I, 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 I hate to say it, but for most of the places I've been are quite substandard. <laughs> uh, but there are some good there are a couple of good restaurants that I've been to, but there, most of them are more. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I go ahead. I didn't hear you. Yeah, there, there, there are there are some good Mexican restaurants, but usually they're family run. Um, people have moved over here. Uh, there, there are a few of those, but most of them are the big chains, and they aren't that good. Have, I have you to move? <laughs> Can I ask Dan a question, please? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Have you tried Filipino food in the UK, Dan? I know there's a large population of Filipinos in the UK. You know, I haven't tried it here. I've had, I've tried it quite a few times over in California. Oh, what do you like? What do you like? Oh, I to love eat? it. Uh, don't 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 do that to me. Huh? <laughs> have you had the dogo? Have you had the dogo? I, I wouldn't know the names of it. I just know that when I go, I absolutely love it. Yeah. Okay, I'm sure you did. Well, England luckily has has finally taken uh, culinary uh, to their hearts and has has gone away. Because I mean, I know the first time I thought about going to England, I was like, oh, I don't want to go to England. I can't eat well there, you know. So uh, now they have all the other good flavors coming around, Italian food, good, you know. And, and it seems like they've gotten a little bit better with their cuisines, and we're not just mm -hmm. eating cold. Cold meat pies and <laughs> uh, there, there are some brilliant restaurants over here now. They, they, oh it's, yeah, it's a, a big improvement to, to twenty years ago. I can assure you. <laughs> can, can I can I just add a little something? Sure, to Dennis. Absolutely. Um, on, on the reverse side, as far as reverse engineering is concerned, a lot of people have asked me uh, how I got acclimated living in the United States. Well, you know, it's been nearly 25 years and I feel like this is home already you know I, I don't give it second thought but one of the reasons why Filipinos are able to adapt easily to living in the United States is because there was a very strong 
American presence in the Philippines, you know. Uh, uh, some people may not be aware that we have, we had some of the largest uh, United States military bases uh, in the Philippines. Like, for example, up until 1991, we had Clark Air Force Base in Pampanga. It was the largest Air Force Base outside of the United States. Then we had the U.S. Naval Base in Subic Bay, Zambales. We had Sangley Point in Cavite, and we had Camp John Hay in Baguio. All of these are located in Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines. Now, what did this do to us? Um, the presence of military bases uh, in these uh, very populated areas influence our culture and our cuisine. See, now when Americans are around, then they bring in American food through the commissary. And I remember as a child, I used to travel with my mom to the neighboring province, and for some reason, we could get into the commissary and buy American food. You know, Provinces where these military bases were located, um, they gave us a liking for things like steak, coffee, chocolates, uh, canned goods, American magazines, which influenced uh, our cooking, gave us more recipes to, to play with. See, our taste buds got used to um, the American way of life, American food, American cooking. And uh, so, you know, so it, it was pretty easy for me to start living here. It felt like, you know, it didn't feel like a foreign land. That's felt more familiar to you yeah, without it before you even came. Yeah. Dennis, I have a question. How do we address people's questions? There are some interesting ones. There is one that um, somebody asked that I think it is really interesting, and that is, um, uh, is do we do that? Can we answer it yes. here on the top? Okay, because yeah, um, which one? I had one. I uh, have some pinned already. There was one from oh, okay. Lowry. Yes, that's the one that's so right. interesting. That um, yeah. Well, the Euro yeah, it, yeah. Who asked that? The, he, he said that the European Union wants to ban the use of European names like Parmigiano, Feta, Gorgonzola, and um, and you know, I, it sounds like mostly cheeses, but probably other oh ham as well. Um, yeah, made in the United uh, States. That's food is belonging. Yeah, Black Forest ham, Greek yogurt, Valencia oranges, and prosciutto. And he yeah. did leave a, a, a website address too. To so a, he wanted to know what we thought story. about that. So I, I don't know how others feel about this. I guess I have mixed feelings because I think. These names now are so much a part of our, our lexicon. I mean, you know, um, feta, uh, gorgonzola, um, and, and they're sort of a point of reference, too. You know, we all have an idea of what gorgonzola tastes like or what feta tastes like. I mean, there's good feta and there's bad feta, and there's good gorgonzola and bad gorgonzola. But I think, um, you know, I have mixed feelings because I certainly don't consider the stuff in the green can to be Parmesan or Parmigiana or anything <laughs> like it. Um, you know, so, uh, and I understand the desire to protect, um, you know, those those foods as they are meant to be. Um, I'm wondering how others feel about this issue. You know, can I chime in here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm also a wine blogger, uh, not just food, I do wine. Um, so it's kind of like champagne. Right. You know, it has to be from... You know the Champagne region and in France, and you know it. Uh, I mean, and I completely respect that. I completely respect that that is theirs. Um, but it, now we've just adapted to you know sparkling wine. You know, here's some sparkling wine. Oh, I've never had Prosecco. Oh, it's you know. But I think we're just going to adapt. If it does happen, we'll just adapt to the new terminology and whatever it is. You know, it's like that's our new phrase that we're going to mm -hmm. use. So I, I mean, if they decide to just own that. Uh, that phrase, whatever uh, name, I, I have, I have, I don't, I, I don't have any problem with it whatsoever. No, I, I think sometimes it might be a little late to put the cat back in the bag there. Right. But if they do do it, like you said, we'll adapt. You know, things will go on. We're not going to stop eating American-made some of these cheeses, and you know, maybe it'll help get rid of some of the some of the batter ones that we see getting imported. Because I, I know I get my gorgonzola, right. and if I don't get the right one, it's like, oh, yeah. I, I finally got my wife to eat it, and now I get some bad Gordon's on this. Oh, this is crap. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's so many wonderful American cheeses now, too, which is... Oh, yeah. 
just great, yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, artisan American cheeses are going to come a long way, and maybe that'll force them to even get better, And which so I don't think it'll be a bad thing. You know, and I'm still going to look for my imported prosciutto when I want something good. You know, it, it's just the way it is, but uh, until you can find me something better American-made in food. But <laughs> here's another question. Here's one from Kim Boltman. Oh, I lost it. Where to go? Uh, here it is. Again, uh, I haven't done this lately, and here we go. Okay, question for the panel. Do you see a trend towards families cooking together, sharing recipes, etc.? Seems like a whole generation missed that during the convenience age in the oh, U.S. That's a great question. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I do see that. Uh, you know, I, I think people have rediscovered cooking in this country, which is wonderful. Um, and I hope families are cooking together. I have a friend who... Um, has a business called the Six O'Clock Scramble, and it's kind of a menu subscription service. and And she really um, encourages people to cook together and eat together. And we're all so busy; it's so difficult for us to make dinner during the week and sit down and eat together. But I try to do it in my family, um, and I work from home, so for me, it's probably easier than for people who have to, you right. know, go to work every day. Um, but since I write cookbooks and I I write out of the house. Um, I'm lucky I'm able to do that. I also see, though, at the same time, this parallel trend, which is if you don't ever want to cook again, you don't have to, um, because there is so much food around us. There is drive-through fast food places. There's prepared food sections in supermarkets. Um, you know, at, at the um, Wawa, you know, at the gas station. I mean, you get, you literally can get food everywhere. So I think it still is. Um, a decision that families have to make, a conscious decision that they're going to spend time and effort doing this. It's so worth it to have the, that time to sit down around the table together. And, and as Maggie was saying, to cook together. You know, I have a daughter who's 15 and she loves to cook. She doesn't care to cook Italian because I do that. So she loves to cook, um, you know, Thai food and Vietnamese food. And she's made wonderful homemade sushi. Um, but, you know, like Maggie, it just fills my heart when I see my kids in the kitchen. Yeah. Well, I, I want to also say something going back to to um, cooking at home. I think the recession kind of changed everything for us because people couldn't afford going out to eat, and they were kind of forced to cook. And they and you know, but food watching is so shows, cheap. Some, you know, it, well, no, I'm talking about just a few years ago, and it kind of changed yeah. a little bit. You know how people couldn't really afford going out, so they want and they wanted to taste good food, so they started going to uh, blogs and you know watching these shows on TV. Okay, we have to go and learn how to make risotto or some of these different dishes that they wanted to eat at home. I understand that things are changing a little bit, but it kind of also changed restaurants too because you know they had to make it a little more affordable. So you had these restaurants, or at least here in San Diego, I've seen a lot of restaurants pop up where they are um, they're affordable. You know they're much more much more affordable now to eat at. Um, so I, I think the recession, or you know, a few years ago, definitely changed the way Americans eat and eat at home. Um, but <laughs> can I add to that, uh, sure. please? Um, uh, as far as uh, food, uh, home cooking is concerned, in our home, it's always. I mean, I don't see food as a trend, and I try not to look at trends. I just cook put it on the table and we eat. Now, Filipino food has always been served family style. Like a big platters are put in the middle of the table and we pass it all around. You know, Filipino food is not served uh, a la carte with small portions. No, it's always been big portions, whether it's home cooking, a party, or a big family event. It's because we see food as a blessing, we see food we view food as something to share because it's something we love. Um, home cooking has always been a norm for Filipinos. It's because uh, the, uh, our way of life has always been to pick uh, produce from the backyard and cook what is on hand, what ingredients are available. So uh, eating out has been an exception for us for as far as our family is concerned. Uh, now and then we we do that for special occasions, but uh, I've never seen 
uh, home cooking as a trend, you know, that's coming back. No. Like I said, our food, Filipino food, is a tradition to savor. Yeah, for you, it never went away. No, <laughs> it's been here. Social media, yeah, social media just gave it more importance uh, and prominence. That's the way I see it. It's not something that's, you know, oh, it's in fashion. No, no. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I, you know, Betty Ann, that's, that's how I was raised. I was raised with my mom cooking, and that's what we ate, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. But being a, a mom of a six-year-old, you know, it's, it's hard to compete. I've written this many times. It's hard to compete with chicken nuggets, you know, because he loves his chicken nuggets, and he loves his pizza, and he wants all of this. And it's like, what are you making me? Uh, yeah, I don't want chile con carne. It's like, what are you making? You know, he's like, I want something different. Um, and, and I think that's another reason what's kind of prompted me to kind of make even fusions uh, for him because he uh, he is such a great source of inspiration, a great source of inspiration uh, for in my cooking. He's in it. He's in it. Uh, he wants to taste something. I'll change my food a little bit just for him so he can eat certain things. You know, I'll, I'll sneak in, well, sneaky mom, sneaky veggies come in here or there. Um, but I would love to... I wish I, I had that. I wish I could just go back to the way my mom just presented, just what Betty Ann was talking about, the here is your food, this is what you're eating, now, and here's You can do <laughs> it. You can do it. You just do I it. Hope. <laughs> I have hope for this kid. It's like, please, come on, food. Oh, another thing about my son. I think I mentioned this to you, Chef. Um, I speak to him in Spanish, only, only in Spanish. So, oh, and my son's a redhead, like ginger, red hair. Uh, green eyes and the whole bit, and uh, you know I speak to him in Spanish. Uh, so when we're cooking, and he responds in English. That's the bad part about this whole thing is that he, you know, here's me, you know, and he's yes, mom. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah, that's that's I my. Found here in the, I found it here in the UK anyway uh, that a lot more families are cooking at home, and turning their turning their back on the supermarkets as well. There's a lot of good. Uh, Farmers markets and uh, farm shops, and people are using those cool. and getting the family in the kitchen and, and cooking a lot more. Yeah, the farmers market is such a wonderful thing that has happened. Um, you know, I uh, here in the U.S. and it sounds like over in the U.K. as well. Over the last few decades, we can get all this wonderful fresh produce, even if we don't have gardens ourselves, and yes. um, and we can cook seasonally, mm -hmm. um, which I think people had many people had to relearn how to do. Um, was mm -hmm. you know American cooking used to be seasonal, and then we you know the convenience era came along, and now we're you're learning how to cook seasonally, which is just yeah. terrific. And the food tastes so much better too when you when you purchase mm -hmm. it. Absolutely. We have another comment and question up here from uh, Jenny Feel, and it's, uh, "Would you consider the Indian food in the UK to be authentically Indian, or more like Mexican food in the US, more Tex-Mex? Is it Indian filtered through the lens of the British palate, or is it pretty true to what you'll find in India, Dan?" Uh, it's nothing like what you'll find in India, really. Um, the Indian food that's here in the UK, uh, you have to remember that we're, we're after the, the, the days of the British Raj, at the end of the British Raj, a lot of people migrated over here, and many of them didn't know how to cook, but they opened restaurants because that was the way they, they, they could make money. And uh, that just progressed. So like in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, People didn't go to the curry house because the food tasted good. They went there because at 11 o'clock the bars closed, and the only way the place they were going to get a drink was if they went to a curry house at the end, because that's where they that's where they would serve they would serve the liquor until until three o'clock in the morning. Um, but then the food did start getting better, and it really is a lot different to what you're going to find in India or Pakistan or Bangladesh, any of that old, old part of India. But it's a it's a it's a style of cooking that people love here, and it, it, I mean, I just lo fell in love with it when I moved over here. I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. So it, it is a different style of cooking. I would say it's very much uh, different, just, just, just like uh, the Mexican food in, in California is a lot different to what you find down in Mexico. Uh, that's the same thing you're going to find here. You're going to have the same spices. You're going to have the garlic and the ginger flavor in there. You're going to have some kind of a garam masala or, or different spices like that. But 
it's 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 done differently. It's done on a fast. So you, you have to you have to. It's no there's no slow cooking here. You have to you have to have everything prepared so that you can get everything out on the table very quickly. So they usually start with a here the, in the curry houses they start with a, a curry base, which is a base sauce, which is really nothing more than a, a, a vegetable stock, which is then blended down. So it's just a very smooth vegetable stock. And to that, they add whatever. They might add, or add lots of chili and some vinegar to make a vindaloo or add some cream and some saffron and uh, some, uh, a little bit of garlic and some cardamom to make a, a, a korma. And uh, so that, you use that base sauce for everything, mm. which is not done in, uh, in India. In India, uh, everything would be done separately and uh, as... as on the day. That's interesting. That's a different take on it. We have another question here from uh, Kim Goldman, and it was, uh, what's the best oil for high heat, stir-fry Indian dishes? Dan? So the best oil is going to be, um, well, in most of the restaurants and also in India, they use vegetable oil, but what, what the most authentic is what they call ghee, and ghee is, it's well, it's a, it's a clarified butter, but it has it's it's more of a it's 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 fermented in a way. It has a, a, a slightly different flavor, and I don't believe that you can make it. It's just if you were to make clarified butter, um, that is a ghee, but it's it has a different flavor to it somehow. Excellent. I want to do a couple quick shout outs. Uh, Andy Lines is in there, and she just mentioned that her 18 year old son has no interest or co capability for cooking, so I've taught him how to order out and compile a few non-cooking recipes, use the blender and clean up for the chef. Uh, where her 16-year-old son is a natural chef and makes up recipes all the yeah. time, just like his mother. <laughs> nice. So thanks for being here, Andy. Uh, Tina Willis is in the house, too. And uh, she's also saying about cleaning up after the chef is a very important skill. Uh, yes, it is. And I, I tend to clean up after myself most of the time. Otherwise, my wife would have too much to do. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Bradford Lowry's in the house. Uh, we did see uh, Mia Voss in here earlier, and she said yeah. hello. And uh, we yeah. consider ourselves uh, Thelma and Luis. So <laughs> those she's are our here. She's in San Diego. I saw her yesterday. She's here in San Diego. She mentioned that. She said uh, she said hi to you from San Diego. So I'm glad she got to come out there and, and meet with you guys. You know, you guys are having way too much fun out there with the it's hurls. Yesterday's hurl. Uh, yeah, I'm just glad everyone hid their cameras. <laughs> uh -oh. well, you saw part. Did you watch uh, part of yesterday's show? Rachel? No, I did not. I, I had a rough day yesterday, so I, I was off the internet most of the day. But uh, I, I will go back and see it. Uh, yeah, I'm a little jealous. I wanted to go out there with them, but I, I you know, it wasn't the timing wasn't right. So it was it's, a lot of fun yesterday. It's hard for me to leave Florida right now too, because I just am loving Florida so much. So. <laughs> uh, Chef Dennis, can I just quickly add about, sure. uh, in connection to what Dan was saying about influence, I have to tell you, Dominica, that Italian food is well loved. We've seen in Manila, in the Philippines, and Italian food is big over there. And is it very the, different? Oh uh, yes. Here's where the difference lies. And my my sons have noticed that when I serve spaghetti, it's, it's sweet and it's smothered yeah. in sauce. Okay, contrary to what you said earlier, and I had to explain to my son, see, I'm not apologizing, I said, and like I said earlier, geography has a lot to do with the way uh, Filipino food has evolved. Uh, one of the major crops, agricultural crops in the Philippines is sugar, mm -hmm. and sugar uh, back then was a cheap extender to a meal, like, mm. you know, like the other crops. So. Sugar was always added as a, to spaghetti sauce. So if you, you ever, develop a taste for sweet things too. Yes, with yeah. the, correct. Mm -hmm. sure. So therefore, uh, when my sons are not home, I revert to spaghetti Filipino style for my husband and myself. <laughs> All right. When my American raised sons come home, and my son is engaged, by the way, to an American Italian, so I'm trying to learn. Uh, we, I revert back to, I try very hard to cook spaghetti the Italian way, and I know I'm not succeeding because I see my son's faces, so what I do is I make my son cook pasta when they're... There you go, that's the answer. So that's the end of that, you know, but Italian food, Italian food, Mexican food, Indian food, 
Chinese, Japanese, these are all very well-loved cuisines in Manila, mm. in the Philippines, among Filipinos. And I have to tell you, Maggie, hablo español. Muy bien. Hablo español. Ah, qué bien. Yes, yes. because, yeah. you know, Spain was in, uh, yes. a colonizer for nearly 500 years. My yeah. great-grandmother was from Spain. I spoke Spanish before I spoke English. Yeah. So, well, you know, in the way that you're describing the spaghetti, uh, my mother, when we were younger, she used to make the spaghetti sauce that was sweet, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, she called it spaghetti, and I thought, what is, uh, now looking back on it, it's like, what, this would, yeah. Like, I remember introducing my mother to basil. <laughs> you know, she mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing how we did not use basil for the longest time? Yeah. Or fresh basil, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm talking stuff about just dry, dry stuff. Yeah, I'm talking about like dry, dried basil, and she, yeah, she still. And when she, it's same as Betty Ann. Whenever we go over, she'll if, and we're making spaghetti, which usually does not happen. Uh, but if she is, it's usually more geared to the American tongue. But I've seen her do her little sweet sauce. It's creamy. It's just it's yeah, it's good, but it's not it's not what I I have. You know, in my mind, my taste buds. Well, with a Mexican mother and a father who was English Irish that had absolutely no idea about Italian cuisine <laughs> other than he did enjoy it, my mother used something called spatini to make sauce. What's that? It was a oh my god! It was a box mix of spices oh. that you added to tomato paste. Oh, see, no tomato paste. I never ever put. Tomato paste in my tomato sauce ever. Mm. Uh, I oh. don't, I do not like that. Oh, that I don't pasty, either. That pasty flavor. Uh -huh. um, I use tomato paste very rarely. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, and I only put it in my bolognese sauce, which is not a tomato sauce. It's a meat sauce, right. and there's mm -hmm. a big difference. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, I I just never liked that. Um, concentrated tomato no. flavor, except in certain instances in which it's called for. Yeah, yeah interesting. <laughs> well, I, I sent her as a child. I even knew then that this was not spaghetti sauce. I had no idea, <laughs> but I know <laughs> this can't be right. And I, I remember sending her. I made her go to the lunch ladies at school because their spaghetti was better and get the recipe from them. Uh, but that was what my father was used to. You know, he, we had kidney stew. I mean, he was English, Irish, and my mother learned to make some of those foods. So that was what he knew. And that's, that's like the days of Chongqing was our Chinese food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I think back to those yeah. times, here we thought we were adventurous explorers, you know, eating different foods. The only thing, the good thing that did come out of that was my father was stationed in Louisiana growing up uh, when he was in the Army, and I was born in an Army base, but and shrimp were a throwaway food that the poor people ate. So when we ate shrimp, we would go through a whole five-pound box, pretty much. It wow. would be fried shrimp until you couldn't eat fried shrimp anymore or shrimp cocktails. So that was something that he did instill. So even now, somebody sends me at a plate with eight fried shrimp, and I'm going, well, that's a nice appetizer, but where's the, where are the rest? That's the first course. Okay. Well, uh, can, I just, can I just add something, uh, uh, Chef Dennis? I wanted to say that as a country and as a people, um, there's something noteworthy about Filipinos is we have the tenacity as a people to face natural calamities and consequent food shortages after that. You see uh, Typhoon Haiyan was just a, an example in November. And after everything is said and done, this catastrophes and calamities only serve as a stimulus for our imaginative cooking. See, nothing edible is thrown out in Filipino culture. We summon all our creativity to come up with the next dish out of what we have, leftovers, backyard produce, agricultural crops we plant, you know, whatever we have on hand. Because to us, food is a blessing, food is a sign of prosperity, food is to be shared with the people we love. We love to share what we love to do and what we, what we have, our Filipino food. So that's, uh, in, that's in essence, that's, that's beautiful. That's us. Yeah. And, you know, I Thank think you. I find with most ethnic 
people. They waste not, want not. You know, yeah. Italian cooking is very much. Cucina so. povera, yeah. I mean, which is of course all the rage now. But um, you know, there's a soup in Italian cooking called uh, I think it's from Tuscany, aqua cotta, which means cooked water. Yeah. Um, and it's basically, you know, um, uh, Betty, you mentioned the uh, holy trinity of Filipino aromatics in Italian. In, mm -hmm. in Italy, it's onion, celery, and carrots, mm -hmm. and you just dice those up and, um, you know, bread, water, whatever other vegetables you have on hand, and salt, and of course a good drizzle of olive oil at the end, and, um, you know, you can turn, it's like stone soup, you know, it's, mm -hmm. um, yes. it's delicious by the time it's ready to eat. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love bread soup too, yeah. oh my goodness, one yeah. of my favorites. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've learned to cook some. So real quick, we're, we're at the end of this. I'm going to go through the panel one last time, and I want you to tell me if you had to pick one dish from your culture. Uh, <laughs> I know it's a hard, Ouch. hard question. Just tell Ouch. me one of your favorites. One of your oh, favorites. Oh, my God. Oh, well, do I have to go first? Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, give you one of my favorite Abruzzese uh, dishes. It's called maccheroni alla chitarra, which um, <laughs> it's uh, kind of like a square-cut spaghetti, um, and it's it's kind of a sturdy pasta, and it's um, the noodles are cut on this instrument called a chitarra, which, is, which means guitar, and it's a... It's a it's strung with wires, and you roll your pasta sheet over it, and um, so these square-cut noodles are what come, uh, you know, are, are the shape, and and you sauce it with um, abruzzese ragu, and that's different mm -hmm. from other ragus. It's um, you start with chunks of meat that you brown, and then you add, um, you know, your aromatics and your tomatoes, and you um, let the sauce cook, and then at the end you actually take the meat out, so it's really a meat-flavored tomato sauce, and um, that's a you know, you will see that dish all over Abruzzo, and um, sometimes it's served with teeny tiny, I mean, like smaller than chickpea-sized veal meatballs, and um, just mixed right into the sauce, and it's delicious Yum. and hearty. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to pick that because that's the first thing that came that's to my good. head. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. Since they pull that meat out of there, what do they do with it? Well, of course, Italians are resourceful. They would never throw it away. They would either serve it as, a, you know, the secondo, or um, if there weren't enough for secondo, they might chop it up and use it as a ravioli filling. Very good. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that's what I wanted to know because I knew it didn't get the trash. Yeah. Thing. Yes. <laughs> Maggie, what is your favorite Mexican dish? Okay, I yeah, that's hard, but I'm gonna go with tamales. Um, tamales. Uh, mm. Yeah, the res uh, beef. They're just beef tamales. My grandmother, uh -huh. God bless her, she were living. The, I, I love them, love, 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 and it's during Christmas time we give them to each other. So oh. you're, you're, you know, you're always left feeling like a big tamale <laughs> at the end of Christmas time because everybody takes over buñuelos, and right, these uh, fried tortillas and cinnamon and sugar, and, and oh, they'll bring over tamales. And so everybody has different tamales, and you have big tamaladas, which are uh, tama uh, tamale parties. Yeah. So yeah, tamale parties. That's the way to do tamales. You get kids in there. Uh, I mean, I remember my grandmother's house during Christmas time. I'm talking big macho men with their boots, you know, sitting there making tamales. <laughs> you know, everybody's making tamales. That's the way to do them. And you go over someone's house and there you are, slathering it on, you know, and rolling them up and, you know, it's one big party. That's how, that's how we party in Mexico. We, we make tamales. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on that one. I, I think tamales have to be my favorite Mexican food. And I remember growing up, we'd go to the tamale factory, and I think it was like a dozen oh. for a dollar. And uh, we'd sit home, and I'd peel them off, eat them warm, and I'd have to have a glass of milk with them. So I, I, that old habits never go away. I, our farmer's market, there's a woman selling tamales, and I'll buy them. And if I don't eat them on the, in the car on the way home and make a total mess, I pull out the milk and I get home and finish them off. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, tam I, yeah, I'm hungry. Oh, <laughs> I'm hungry. Go I'm real good dog. right now. All right, Betty Ann. What okay. Oh, I've been Filipino waiting for dish? this. My, well, it's hard to pick. It's like asking who is your favorite child, but I would say, <laughs> I will say a favorite of mine and in most Filipino homes will be our national dish, the adobo. Uh, I always have a Pyrex of adobo in our house in my refrigerator, and I make a fresh batch every week. If you come today, I'll serve you some. Um, adobo is best served with rice. I have a pound of pork belly 
chopped up in chunks. I have a pound of chicken and I mix it together and cook it in a stew of garlic, peppercorns, bay leaves, uh, cider vinegar, a hint of soy sauce. Uh, you know, I mix it up, marinate it the night before, then I put it all in a pot and it stews slow simmer for a couple of hours and the house smells so I, I, I can't describe to you the feeling. The, the the aroma of garlic is all over the house. It's it, mm. you know, it's like imagine it's like uh, a smoke going through uh, the curtains under the table all over through the kitchen through the dining room the living room it seeps through everywhere uh, but it's delicious it's you can it's very versatile because of the way it's cooked you can travel with it you can bring it at the potluck you can serve it on the dinner table you can serve it at the party uh, if there are leftovers I pan fry it to a crisp you know, little flakes like mm -hmm. I, what I did last night. It's on my Facebook wall. And I put it over garlic rice, which I cook with the drippings. Oh. So you can imagine it's garlic uh, on garlic. Anytime you mention drippings, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah. And I wait, end, wait, forgive me, I'm going to start drooling here. I know. <laughs> amazing. And I, well, and, and then I end that meal with fresh, ripe Atalfo mangoes, which are my favorite. Everybody knows I'm mango queen on Twitter. And yes. It's because it's my favorite fruit. So that's my favorite meal. And, I, and it appeals to a lot of Filipinos. And even if we have guests who are not Filipinos, you know, they, they enjoy it. I, I can see why. Yeah. And last but not least, Dan, what is your favorite Indian dish? Uh, I've had a lot of favorites over the years, but right now it has to be, it's a southern Indian dish. It's called dosas. I'm not sure if any of you heard of them. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. It's a uh, Rice and ura dal lentils, it's like a white lentil, which is then uh, soaked in water overnight and then ground for about, blended for about 10 minutes into a really creamy batter and then fermented for about 36 hours. And then you just you, you make a crepe out of it. And those are stuffed with either a spicy mashed potato or for me, I like, I like to put uh, uh, what they call a kima in it, which is a almost well, it's a, a ground uh, ground beef, but it has lots of different Indian spices in it. Or even a a, a lamb curry goes well with it. But they're just they're they're really they're, they're a different flavor. If you've never had a dosi, you've got to try one. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm coming over for dinner. I'm so hungry. <laughs> I know. I know. We have really run the gambit of some delicious flavors today, and uh, I thank you all for sharing them with us and being here today with us. Well, uh, thank you. Been a, been a lot of fun, and you know, this is the first time I've had a whole foodie lineup on, so this is a whole new <laughs> oh. show for us. Oh, I hope so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Seth. My pleasure, and thank you all for being here today, and thank I'll you. see you uh, soon you. again. See you yeah. next week for Good Day Google Plus, and make Bye, sure everybody. you meet somebody Bye. new on the Plus, <laughs> follow all of our foodies here, and uh, enjoy. Oh, boy. There you go, Leah. Yeah, say goodbye yeah. in your language. Uh, ciao. <laughs> Adios. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. All right. <laughs> See you all.